All right, great. So um, I am an assistant professor at the University of Michigan in the School of Nursing. I have a PhD in psychology from UC Berkeley, and I was a postdoc for several years at UC San Francisco. So I'm going to tell you about um, research I've been doing for the past few years. And <clears throat> the point I want you to know at the beginning uh, is that type 2 diabetes is prevalent and dangerous. Um, and it used to be not that common, and now it's quite common. So from 1980 to 2014, the number of adults in the U.S. with diabetes has quadrupled. Um, U.S. adults have a 40% risk of being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in their lifetime. Um, th these were the most recent results I could get. Um, here we have all the counties, and the red ones um, have more than 11.2% of adults with diagnosed type 2 diabetes. Um, and uh, it leads to all sorts of complications. You probably know this, but um, it's a leading cause of blindness um, in working age adults. Uh, it leads to amputations and, um, and kidney problems. And about half of people with type 2 diabetes actually have these complications. And one out of 10 healthcare dollars are spent on type 2 diabetes. So it's a big problem. Um, how do we diagnose it? Well, one of the main ways is that we look at people's HbA1c, which is basically a marker of their average blood sugar for the past um, few months. Um, it uh, <coughs> measures hemoglobin and what percent of it is bound to sugar. So I'm going to be using this term HbA1c or A1c, and that's just um, talking about this sort of average blood sugar. And if you have a 6.5% or higher of that, then we say that you have type 2 diabetes. Um, so how do we help people with type 2 diabetes? Well, one of the main things we can do is we can reduce blood sugar. And so here's a study showing that if you can reduce that A1C by 1%, you can reduce those microvascular complications, the blindness, the amputation, um, kidney problems by 37%. So it's a big deal if we can reduce A1C. Um, you may uh, know this, but historically, we treated type 2 diabetes uh, with um, a ketogenic diet. Basically, um, I actually saw this first at the low carb cruise a few years ago. Um, Andrea Seinfeld was presenting, and I thought it was hilarious. It's from the diabetic cookery from 1917. Notice that oatmeal is by permission only. <laughs> beats on doctor's orders. Um, but it is a, a very low carbohydrate diet. And Elliot Joslin was uh, one of the first physicians in the US to focus on diabetes. And here's his diet from 1915. It's a very low carbohydrate diet. And again, it's funny to me because what does he put in his strict diet at the very end? Crack cocoa. Those are cocoa nibs. So you could have dark chocolate even 100 years ago on a very low carb diet. <laughs> Um, so here's a study from 1983 showing just how important it is that people with type 2 diabetes avoid carbohydrates if they want to keep their blood sugar lower. So here are people without on the left and with diabetes on the right being fed fructose, sucrose, potato, wheat, and glucose. And then you can see what happens to their blood sugar um, or their plasma glucose. And you can see that it goes twice as high um, if you have type 2 diabetes than if you don't. Um, and so I did an informal meta-analysis of all of the previous research, and there have been 17 previous trials published of very low-carbohydrate diets for uh, adults with type 2 diabetes. The average length was 12 months, and on average, A1C dropped a unit of 1%, and body weight loss was 8%. We say that if people lose at least 5%, that's an excellent metric for improved health. And I was part of a review a few years ago where we talked about why type 2 diabetes should be um, treated with a very low carbohydrate diet. But you might look at this and think, 17 trials, that's enough. Um, but I, I want to keep going. Um, I, I've talked um, to the American Diabetes Association, and um, they're, they're looking for programs that have even lower dropout, longer adherence. And so I'm trying to create a program that has great dietary adherence, high program satisfaction, few dropouts. And also, lately, um, the most recent recommendations from the American Diabetes Association says basically we need to prescribe these behavioral programs for people with type 2 diabetes who are motivated to lose weight. So intervention development. What have I been doing for the past few years? I've created a novel intervention for type 2 diabetes. We talk about positive affect, mindfulness, lots of behavioral support, exercise and sleep guidelines, and then low carb, all with the goal of trying to improve adherence and health. So this crowd doesn't need to know that much about the diet, right? Um, so it's a very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet. Uh, people are encouraged to eat 20 to 35 non-fiber grams of carbs a day. 
uh, keep their protein roughly about the same, so 80 to 100 grams, 120 grams a day, and rest of their calories from fat. It's an ad libitum diet, meaning they eat when they're hungry and stop when they're full. Okay, so here's some stuff that maybe this crowd doesn't know that much about. Um, this is a great book if you want to learn about some of these things by Sonia Lubomirsky. She's a professor at UC Riverside. And these are all positive affect strategies. So we talk about things like gratitude, savoring, personal strengths, positive reappraisal, positive activities, all different ways to try to help people feel more positive affect. Sounds a little strange, but um, the theory behind trying to help people feel more positive affect is basically it helps people cope and people do more of what they like. So how does it help people cope? By feeling more positive affect, by feeling happier, broadens people's perspective. So Barb Fredrickson is a, a, a big leader in this field and she talks about how positive affect broadens our perspectives, it builds our resources. Um, Susan Folkman talks about positive affect serving as a timeout from stress. And I really love um, this theory, the hedonic theory, which is basically you do more of what you like. So if I can create a program that people like, maybe they'll do it more, right? Um, you wouldn't believe how a lot of the pr original programs really don't sound like that much fun. Um, so we also added stuff about mindfulness and mindful eating. So this is awareness and acceptance of hunger and fullness, cravings and triggers, flavor, texture, aroma, thoughts and feelings. And how does this help? Well, this is to help people learn to acknowledge, but not to act on their impulses, right? So you can say, ah, I really like that cookie. You're aware of it, but you don't act on it. That may reduce emotional eating. It may reduce eating due to external cues. Okay, so, and we use all sorts of behavioral support. So this is based on Bandura's social cognitive theory of self-regulation. Um, it's a lot of sort of self-explanatory self stuff, but people self-monitor their diet, their exercise, their sleep. That helps people self-diagnose and self-motivate, hopefully. We have lots of vicarious experiences, such as quotes from successful others, to improve self-efficacy and to develop new norms. Uh, I'm always looking for good quotes of people who've sort of gone through the experience, you know, kind of struggled and then overcame it. So if you have any good quotes, send them my way. I'll pepper my program with them. Um, and then we have a slow skills transition to improve self-efficacy. So the first week, we have people change their breakfasts and their uh, snacks. Then we add lunches and then we add dinner. Okay, and um, I'm not sure if you know Michelle Seeger. She's actually a researcher at the University of Michigan, where I am. She has a great book called No Sweat, all about basically positive uh, affect and exercise. And so although I didn't originally incorporate her ideas in our intervention, um, I really like the way she talks about physical activity as really a gift you give yourself something you enjoy. Um, so we encourage people to be physically active, and we have this spin where try to find something you actually enjoy, because then you'll keep doing it. And you guys probably know that physical activity is related to everything good. Um, uh, blood sugar control, reduced inflammation, reduced depression and anxiety. We also talk about sleep, which I think is pretty overlooked. Um, but you can sleep deprive healthy people and give them prediabetes in just a week or two. So it's really causal that sleep is important for blood glucose control. So we encourage people to sleep seven to nine hours a night. Uh, face mask, earplugs. Uh, I was at a hostel last night. I definitely use that. Um, and uh, flux. So that's... Uh, an app to redshift your screen um, so that it doesn't keep you up at night. All right, so I'm gonna talk to you about a couple of published trials and then a couple of trials that are ongoing. So this was um, the first trial we did. It was an in-person program. Um, and I was lucky enough to work with Steve Finney on this project. Um, we recruited 34 overweight individuals with type 2 diabetes or prediabetes, not on insulin. And their baseline A1C was about 7%. So they're pretty well controlled. It was a 12-month program, weekly catered to our classes for about four months. I catered it. It was fun. Um, and then meetings every two months for the remaining time. So in this study, it was a randomized trial. Uh, this is sort of the gold standard when you're trying to compare two things, right? People are randomly put into one group or another, and they were randomly given, um, assigned the very low carbohydrate diet classes, or they were randomly assigned an American Diabetes Association carbohydrate counting diet. And then everybody got all the other goodies I was talking to you about, positive affect, mindfulness, etc. Okay, so the carbohydrate counting diet was probably what you guys think of as the healthy diet from before, right? Low fat fruits and vegetables, whole grains. Um, this was, as far as we could tell, sort of the standard of care um, at UCSF at the time. So we weren't trying to give people a bad diet. Um, and then the other group was taught the low-carb diet. And we measured all their outcomes. 
And just, uh, I can't really give you a sense of this 12 month program, but here's an example handout talking about mindfulness of cravings and triggers. And um, one of the things we're looking for is low dropout. We did pretty well, so after 12 months, there was only 12% dropout in the very low carb group. Um, one thing of note is that we were able to discontinue, um, uh, well, 44% of people discontinued one or more of their diabetes medications in the very low carb group um, uh, versus 11% in the other group. And uh, these aren't published yet, but they will be soon. Um, these are results at 12 months where I, I just tried to clean it up, make it easy to see. You can see the red bars are taller, right? So that um, helps you see that um, uh, the A1C, so we're, I'm looking at two different cutoffs. Did their, people's A1C, if it started above 6.5, that's sort of a cutoff for type 2 diabetes, did it go below 6.5 after 12 months? And you can see three-fourths of people in the very low-carb group um, were able to lower it that much, only a quarter in the other group. And then I asked, did people lose at least 5% of their body weight over the 12 months? And you can see about three-fourths in the very low-carb group were able to do that versus about a third in the other group. Okay, so that's a trial I did um, in person, but I really wanted to move to online um, because I think it's important to reach people wherever they are. Uh, so this is a paper that was actually published last week, I think, uh, the Journal of Medical Internet Research where I recruited, again, it's a tiny trial, but just getting going, 25 uh, overweight adults with type 2 diabetes, um, elevated A1C of 6.5 to 9 on no diabetes medications other than metformin, because I didn't want to do medication management with an online program. I thought that would sound a bit tricky, and as you probably know, met, if you're on metformin, you're very unlikely to have a hypoglycemic episode if you go on a low-carb diet. Uh, their baseline A1C was 7%. And uh, again, pretty well controlled. It was an eight-month program. And again, it was a randomized trial. So uh, my advisors at the time said, just do a minimal control group on the other side, and then all of your goodies on, the, on one side. So people were randomized either to the American Diabetes Association plate method diet, which is pretty similar to the other one, only it's a lot easier to teach. You divide a nine-inch um, plate uh, in half and one half are green veggies, then you have lean meats and, and carbs in a, um, a quarter, uh, fruits and dairy. Again, sort of whole grains, fruits and vegetables, uh, calorie counting kind of diet. And then everybody else um, were assigned to uh, the very low carbon goodies program. Uh, I have a national account with LabCorp, so people could live anywhere and then they could get their blood drawn from LabCorp. I mailed them a scale and so I have lots of pictures of people standing on scales. Um, and so, again, can't really give you a sense of this online eight-month program, but here's an example slide where I'm talking about how you might increase your food variety, um, introducing people to Linda's low-carb recipes, which, if you don't know, is a great website. Never met Linda, but she does a good job. Um, I've donated her cause. So, um, again, we're really interested in dropout, and the people in the plate method diet, I couldn't keep them in. Um, so 46% of them dropped out by the end of the trial versus 8% in the low-carb diet and extras group. Uh, the people in the plate method diet uh, were less likely to like how they felt on their diet, and they were said they were more likely to cheat on their diet. And I won't go through the details here, but people did pretty much follow what I asked them to, to eat in terms of non-fiber grams of carbs or percentage of calories from total carbs. And again, tried to make the uh, results pretty clear. So people who were assigned to the very low-carb and extras group uh, about half of them were able to reduce their A1C below 6.5 um, and versus none in the other group. Um, and then in terms of uh, percentage of body weight lost, uh, about 90% in the very low carbon extras group were able to lose at least 5% of their body weight versus about a quarter in the other group. So at this point I said, do I have to keep assigning people <laughs> to the ADA diet? And I started to do intervention development for the very low carb um, diet online program that I've developed. Oh, before I move on, we call this the Michigan football plot. Um, <laughs> and uh, this sort of tracks A1C and weight uh, together. And you can kind of see that the red lines, those are the people in the very low carb group, they're sort of shooting down at the beginning and then there's kind of less activity. It's not the lines aren't quite as long. And that let me know that I, I was getting a lot of change that first four months of the trial. And then the last four months, maybe not so good. So I realized I had to keep, I had to pump up the, the intervention to make it continue, to make it continue to be motivating for people to engage. And all those circles are people who dropped out. So you can see the blue group, they're just like gone. Um, 
Oh, and here are some participant comments. So somebody said, things are going very well. Still excited by the weight loss and blood glucose levels. Thanks for being there. Look forward to the messages each week. And someone else said, very happy with the diet, lack of hunger, weight loss, down 28 pounds in six weeks or so. Had a diabetes checkup with my doctor. My A1C was 5.8, so all good. So these are sort of standard happy comments from participants. So now I'm moving on to optimizing the ketogenic and extras uh, program. And I'm in the middle of running a 12-month trial. So I took my eight-month program and tried to make it super awesome for 12 months. And then I'm uh, varying other pieces. So we recruited 44 overweight individuals with type 2 diabetes, again, on no diabetes medications other than metformin. Their baseline A1C was 8.4, so they're a little less well-controlled, and it's a 12-month program. So what have I been doing to try to improve it? Um, I did a full factorial design. It's a two by two by two. So I'm testing three factors, um, eight groups, and uh, that means everybody gets, uh, well, it's a little hard to explain, but anyway, people are either going to get text messages or not, the breath meter or not, food and book gifts or not. So I've written more than 200 unique text messages that support, and that took a while, it's a lot of fun though, um, <laughs> that support all of the materials that I teach in the class. They come to people, they don't have to sort of uh, reach out to me, I'm sending them inspirational quotes or links to recipes or whatever I think would be interesting. And again, not repeating, it's not like, are you doing low carb? Um, it's a lot of stuff to sort of um, support and excite and inform people. Um, so I, I send people those text messages or not. Um, I assign them to get a breath meter to measure their ketones or um, urine strips. And then I send them lots of gifts from Amazon um, so, or, or not. So, you know, there are so many fantastic ketogenic diet cookbooks. So I picked out I, and I send them even more than this, actually, over the 12 months. So I picked out some great ones. Um, and then I send them some kind of maybe weird, unusual low-carb foods like coconut flour, chia seeds, and almond flour. So they're more likely to try making the low-carb foods. You know, because you can make fantastic low-carb waffles, muffins, etc. if you just have the right tools. So here are some quotes. Um, this is from a participant whose A1C reduced from 8.2 to 6.3 after five months. She says, I'm very happy with my new state of health. My doctor reduced my metformin in half. I want to thank you for giving me control of my sugar cravings and my blood glucose levels. I now have the tools to completely control my own diabetes. Food no longer dominates my thoughts. And here's someone whose A1C went from 11.4 to 5.9 after seven months. He said, I can't really think of any improvements, to be honest. I think you do a good job of providing useful information to stay low carb. Thanks. Last blood test, low triglycerides, all good readings, doctors cutting meds. Thank you. And then here's someone whose A1C reduced from 8.3 to 6.9 after six months. She says, I'm so excited. And she had like 10 exclamation points, but I kind of know. Um, <laughs> my doctor loves this plan to promote a healthier me. Thanks forever. And actually, her doctor is now like, hey, you've lost enough weight. I think, you know, you're good. Now let's try, you know, exercise and stuff. But she's doing really well. So I don't, um, I don't have any findings yet because really my primary outcome is a 12-month outcome uh, because I'm, I'm particularly interested, not just what happens at four months where I have some preliminary results, but what happens sort of over the longer term. So stay tuned. Um, and now I'm starting a third version of the online program where I'm varying positive affect, mindfulness, and tracking. So here's my little advertisement section. I'm now recruiting at succeedstudy.org. So if you know anybody who might be uh, eligible for this trial, please send them my way. So they can just fill out an online survey and I'll get back to them either way. So I have, uh, I was lucky enough to get a five-year grant from the National Institute of Health from NIDDK. Um, they fund research on diabetes. And um, it's supporting me to do this trial. So I'm going to be recruiting 144 overweight individuals with type 2 diabetes, again, um, on no diabetes medications or just metformin. It's similar to the previous trial. Um, I'm uh, adding optional texts. So texts, um, some people love them, but some people actually had me turn them off because they were driving them crazy. <laughs> so I realized maybe texts work if you want texts. Um, I, yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm sending people some gifts. I'm going to um, use urine test strips for this, and I'm measuring over 12 months. And here are the three factors. So I sort of told you, hey, positive affect's wonderful. It's going to help people you know, do this program. But maybe that's wrong. And so since I'm a scientist, I want to test my hypothesis. And so half of people are going to get all the positive affect goodies, and half won't. 
Um, half of people will also get all the mindfulness stuff, or they won't. And then I'm going to be testing whether or not people should be encouraged to track their diet sort of very carefully, a lot, which is the standard in weight loss trials, um, or just a few days every month to kind of just check in and see how they're doing. So we'll see what happens. Um, I'm using DTI Laboratories, which is a great company. I mail away an A1C kit so people can live anywhere in the US. Um, and this time I'm using a scale by Body Trace, which is fantastic. People just stand on the scale and I get their weight. I also get their cat's weight or the dog's weight. So um, <laughs> I have to clean up the data, but I'm pretty sure they didn't lose like 150 pounds immediately. Right? <laughs> so don't have the results. Again, I'm recruiting. Oh, and uh, I have handouts somewhere. They're over there if you want one. So I'm looking for this study. I'm looking for people with a BMI of 25 to 45, 21 to 70 years old, A1C of 6.5 or higher, which I'll measure. Um, no metformin, sorry, on metformin or no glucose lowering medications. They're paid 100 bucks. They get lots of goodies. They get, you know, food and cookbooks and free scale and all that. And it's to help me sort of keep improving this program. So here's just, I, I have lots of ideas of future research, um, lots of students, lots of collaborators. I'm very lucky. But just here are a few things that I'm interested in. So how do we help people keep calm and keto on, right? So um, I'm putting my place, though, because Elliot Joslin, 100 years ago, thought about this. He said, he was looking about, he was thinking about long-term adherence. And he said, the after treatment of diabetic patients is quite as important as the initial treatment. Patients must learn to keep sugar-free and maintain weight. And when difficulties occur, report for advice. So I'm going to just pick up where he left off 100 years ago, and I'd really like to um, do long, big trials um, looking at long-term adherence. And I know other people are doing that too, and I think it's really important. Um, I'm also wondering if we can simplify the rules. I mean, do we have to get in the weeds? Um, I don't know. It, would it be enough, at least for people with type 2 diabetes, just to know, eat this, don't eat that? Will that um, and will that be more accessible? Um, so I'd like to um, try teaching it in an easier way. Um, and I'm also um, debating whether people really need to go on a ketogenic diet or, again, would it just be okay to cut out some things and would a low carb, maybe 100, 125 net grams of carbs a day, be enough? Um, and so right now I'm proposing a, a trial that would compare in people with prediabetes, uh, standard diabetes prevention program, low-fat diet versus a ketogenic diet, and then that middle group, sort of a, a low-carb diet. Who knows what got funded, but I'd really like to do that trial. And that's it. So now I'm, I'm recruiting there, and thank you for your attention. Appreciate it. <laughs>